Amen. God's good, isn't he? Amen. I mean, you know, there's times like today, we've got a lot of requests, a lot of people battling stuff today. I mean, I, I feel that, you know, there's a battle, y'all. Amen. I mean, we've got all kinds of battles. I mean, from sickness to addiction to all kinds of things that, that's being battled. I mean, you know, you just feel the weight of it in the congregation today. Amen. Is anybody feeling it with me? I mean, can you feel the weight? I mean, can I tell you there's something more weighty than our, our problems, and that's God Almighty. Amen. And, and so I, I want to speak a word today. Um, and I didn't know why the Lord gave me something so simple. But sometimes we need to be reminded of, of what our faith really is in. Amen. And how we can keep putting one foot in front of the other, even when it looks like or it appears like we have no hope. Anybody today feeling, you know, like you just don't know if you can make it? Huh? I mean, you know, to where you're just like, man, I don't know that I can make it today. I mean, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, there's times in our, in our walk where we, we feel like we can't make it, y'all. Where we feel like it's heavier than what we can handle. Where we feel like it's a sickness or it's a situation or your work or whatever it might be. Or your children or your wife or your husband or, or whatever's going on. But you just feel like it's more than what you can handle. Can I tell you, you don't have to handle it alone. See, that's the problem, is the devil wants you to think that you're in this fight all by yourself, that you ain't got nobody with you, and when you start seeing things going wrong, and situations, and sickness, and all these things, you say, where's God? God is right there. Amen. Amen. He's in the midst of all this. And so, I was trying to figure out, why is the Lord giving me such a simple word for today? But, but I believe that God, God has his hand in this. So, I, here's your title for today. I always have to give you a title. Here's your title for today. Who is your shepherd? Who's your shepherd today? Amen. Who is your shepherd? Who's looking after you today? Amen. Not, not, and a lot of us maybe, maybe we say, well, maybe it's me. <laughs> I want to tell you, if it's you, you don't have a very good shepherd. Okay. You, God Almighty, he's our shepherd. He's the one that's supposed to look after us. So I want to, I want to preach from the 23rd Psalm today. Something simple, something easy. Can I tell you what I've found in the modern church is that we, we've tried to got, get so slick and try to get so polished and try to bring people in, right? Because we're all about, you know, seeker friendly. Get them all in the church. Well, I'm here to tell you, if you don't feed them when they get here, then they go away hungry, right? I mean, we got to make sure we feed the saints of God when they come to the, the feeding trough, okay, so to speak. We got to feed them. We got to make sure that we give them something that they can, they can put their teeth in, something they can chew on, something they can rest upon or rest in. So I want to go ahead and just read the, the 23rd Psalm. And everybody might say, well, that's what they read at funerals. Well, I'm here to tell you that that psalm's more about living than it is about dying. Amen. That psalm's more about living than it is about dying. Okay? <laughs> because when we live this life, we, we encounter things. We got to battle through things. We have sickness. We have tribulation. We have trial. We have strife. We have all those things. I'm here to tell you, when you leave this world... Amen. And you get turned loose from this flesh and you're in the presence of God. You're, you're not going to need all of that then because you're going to be in glory. Amen. Right now is when we need a shepherd. Right now is when we need to know that there is someone who's looking out for me. There is someone that's got me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, I pray, God, that each one of us as we're here today realize that we have a shepherd, that we have one that, that is looking after us, God, one that is taking care of us, God, one that, one that is three steps out and ahead of us, making sure that you have got us, Lord. And Father, I thank you for that today, God. I thank you that you are that rock that we can put our, our faith in, our trust in, God, that you are there for us, that you are making a way, no matter what we face, no matter what's going on in our world, that you're there, Lord, that you never sleep, you never slumber, but you're always there. And so, Father, Father, I pray, God, that each one of us would, would understand and realize today that we do have a shepherd. 
We do have one that is taking care of us. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, your grace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So what does it mean to be a shepherd, right? Because we, we think about that. We think about that word. It's an old-fashioned word. Um, you know, what does it mean? So you got to start with like a definition anytime you do stuff like this, right? you gotta, you gotta got to define things. So let's, let's get a definition. Um, in, a, in, a, in a farming term or whatever, a person who herds, tends, and guards sheep. So we, we think about it that way. But it, but in a in a in a uh, in, in a human situation is a person who protects, guides, or watches over a person or a group of people. Now, myself as a pastor, I am an under shepherd, right? God is the shepherd, amen. He is the great shepherd. He is the one above. But I've been given, also been given a, a task to be an under shepherd. That every one of you, that you sit in these seats, that I am your shepherd in the sense of this church, amen. It's up to me to make sure that you're being fed. It's up to me to make sure that you're hearing the words of life. It's up to me to hear that you're hearing the gospel over and over again. It's up to me for you to hear something that will get you through till next week, amen, or till next Wednesday or till whenever, or for the next 30 minutes or whatever it might be, that I give you something that's going to get you by. Amen. That when you come in here, that you feel strengthened, that you feel like your, your, your faith has been built, that you feel like that you are able to take another strike at what's going on in your life. But we've got to choose who we will follow in this life. When we say this, the Lord is my shepherd. What does that, what does that entail? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. First of all, it entails that if the Lord is the shepherd, then what are we? Sheep. Sheep. Can I tell you? And I've heard Joey say this before. <laughs> I'll be careful. When it comes from the lips of the youth pastor, better be careful, right? Are sheep smart? Do sheep know what's best for them? And so who are we in this? We're the sheep. But we have a shepherd. Now I want you to think about that for a second. We serve the most high God. We serve a God who, who takes care of us. We serve a God who leads us, who guides us, who directs us. We serve a God. He is our shepherd. And, and then it goes on a little bit further. I shall not want. I'm here to tell you today that there are some of us here today that we're, we're in a mess right now. There's some of us here today that we're like, man, what am I going to do? What, well, how am I going to get through this next, next day or these next 30 days or these next six months or whatever it might be? And I'm wondering, what am I going to do? I'm here to tell you, you're the Lord is your shepherd and you shall not want amen that he is there with you every step of the way that he'll never leave you nor forsake you he is there now that gives me great confidence when I start hearing that that gives me great confidence that I hear that the Lord is my shepherd but can I tell you what we have to do we must choose Jesus as our shepherd we got to let him be in charge Amen. We got to let him have have the wheel. You know, they say, Jesus, take the wheel. Amen. Just let him have the wheel. Let him be the shepherd. Let him lead you. Let him guide you. Let him direct you. Let him do all those things. Because if you keep putting your hands on the wheel, can I tell you what happens? Huh? Yeah, you're going to wreck. I mean, you ever have anybody grab the wheel when you're trying to drive? Puts you in the ditch. Right? We have to decide that the Lord is my shepherd. And we will not want. The problem is, is that a lot of times we choose the Lord as our shepherd, but it's kind of like kicking and screaming. Huh? Anybody? Yeah, anybody ever had, had the Lord leading you in a direction? Anybody ever had the Lord asking you to do something? Anybody ever had the Lord tell you, look, you need to stop doing that? And you're like, oh, 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 oh. you know, I, Lord, I want you to be my shepherd, but do you really have to tell me what to do? Do you really have to, do, you, do I really have to turn myself over and allow control to be to God? 
See, the problem is, is that we all want to be in control. But there can't be but one shepherd. And that's God Almighty. So we've got to ask ourselves, you know, if I'm going to have the Lord as my shepherd, then I've got to let him be in control. I've got to turn it over to him. And, and we've got to understand that, that God knows what's best for us. Can I tell you, God knows what's best for you. God knows what's best for me. God knows what's out there in front of you. You can't see the future, but I can tell you someone who can. God. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we know who holds tomorrow right God's got it he's got it y'all and see that's called faith that's called faith when we walk by faith and not by sight we worry an awful lot for people that have a shepherd who is the most high God we, we have a shepherd who is all-knowing. We have a shepherd who is all-seeing. We have a shepherd who is everywhere at once. We have a shepherd that all he had to do was speak to create the universe. We have that kind of shepherd. That's the God that's our shepherd. Is there anything that's beyond him? No, nothing. Nothing is beyond him. That is who our shepherd is. But we must choose who we will follow in this life. Is the Lord your shepherd today? And you know, I think of all those things that he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's everywhere, he's the creator. Those are all good reasons. But you know why I follow him? Because Jesus laid his life down for me. He laid his life down for me. Anybody need a savior? Does anybody need a savior? See, that's the problem in the world today. When you preach the gospel, is that a lot of people don't think they need a savior. Because they're running their life, they're their own shepherd, and they're in charge of everything. And then it's not until you hit something. It's not until you hit a roadblock. It's not until you hit that sickness. It's not until you worked that job for 20 years and you thought you'd work that job till you were going to die. And then you walk in one Sunday morning and they, or Saturday or Monday morning and they give you a, a pink slip. And they say, I don't need you anymore. Then what do you do? Or you're put in a, put in a situation where you don't feel like, feel like you're, you're ever going to get out of it. Or a doctor tells you, this is your diagnosis. This is what's going to happen in your life. That this is going to happen or that's going to happen or this or that or the other. And you get all these things and all of a sudden you realize that you really aren't in control of anything at all. It's like a perfect storm sometimes where you say, what could possibly go wrong? And then that happens. <laughs> And then, then you like, well, what else could go wrong? And then that happens. And then you're like, what? well, what else could happen? And then three more things happen. And then you feel, realize that you're not really in control of anything. But can I tell you who is? God. And see, that's why we've got to choose him as our shepherd. That's why we've got to choose him, because Jesus Christ laid down his life for each one of us. He, he did something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. He took the sins of the world upon him. He laid down his life for the sheep. He died for you and me to set us free. I'm here to tell you that we have more freedom than anybody in the world in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. We've been set free from sin, from death, from hell, from Satan, from all these things. Every chain can be broken. Hallelujah. Through the power of Jesus Christ. He did all that for us. If I'm going to serve someone, I'm going to serve someone who's all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing, that's absolutely able to, to save me to the uttermost. That's who I'm going to serve. I'm not going to serve any created thing. I'm going to serve the most high God. I choose Jesus as my shepherd. Now, I want you to notice something in verse 2. I never thought about this much. But verse 2 says, he makes me to lie down. In green pastures. You know, I never noticed that. What's it? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He makes me. He makes me. You, are you catching what? He makes me. That means that the sheep don't even know where the green pastures really are. There are times in your life where God makes you lie down where you need to lie down. Where he puts you in a situation. And you may say, well, I don't understand why this has happened. Or I don't understand why that's happened. I don't understand why all this is going on. Can I tell you, there are times where God makes you to lie down 
in a certain place. Some people just need to stop. Some people just need to realize that he's God Almighty and they just got to stop and lie down in that place where he has placed you. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Makes me. Oh my goodness. You know, I never noticed that. But there's times where I absolutely realize that God has made me do it. So you say, well, you got free will, Rick. But sometimes your circumstances. You ever had your circumstances change where you had no choice? Where you had no, you're like, I got no choice. I, there's no way I won't, I don't tell you, I got no choice. I've got to do, that's because God has set it up to get you to the green pasture. I want to be in the green pastures, amen. I want to be in the good places. It says he leads me beside the still waters. That he leads me, he puts me exactly where I need to be. Have you ever wondered at times why things have gone a certain way in your life? Can I tell you that God orders the steps of a righteous man? That when we, when we live this life, when we're walking through this life, and we're doing what we're doing, God is ordering our steps. He's ordering us. He's putting us in the right place. He's leading us beside the still waters. He's making us lie down in the green pastures. He's doing exactly what we need to be done. That gives me hope. That gives me comfort. Because I'm going to tell you, sometimes we look at our situation. Sometimes we look at where we're at or what's going on in our lives. And we're like, how do I ever get out of this? How am I ever going to get victory through this? How am I ever? you got to allow God to be God. you got to allow the Lord to be your shepherd. you got to allow the Lord to put you in the right place. you got to allow the Lord to lead you beside the still waters. I like verse 3. He restores my soul. Anybody ever need restoration? Anybody ever get to the point where you're like, man, whew, I'm empty? Anybody ever been empty? Where you've been emptied out? I mean, not, I'm talking dry, empty. Have you ever been in a cup empty? Empty. Where you're like, man, I can't do that. I am empty. Kind of like this anointing oil right here. Empty. There ain't nothing left, y'all. None left. It is empty. There's nothing left. But we need restoration. Can I tell you what God can do? God can fill us again through the power of His Holy Spirit. It says He restores my soul. Restoration. A God of restoration. What just what does that mean? A God of restoration. I mean, I I think about that. You know. Do you know that the word restore? appears 136 times in the Bible. 136 times in the Bible. Restoration. You know what restoration means? It means taking you back to where you were. And a lot of times it means taking you back to a good place. Sometimes we are living through life. Sometimes we're living through things where we're no longer in a good place. Where we're wondering, how did I get here? Right? How did I get here? I, I, I started over there. That was a good place. But now, now I've gotten way over here. How do I get back there? How do I get back to that place? Amen. Where, where I have a peace. And, and, and I mean, and only God can give us peace. Only God can give us the peace that passes all understanding. Only God can carry all our, our worries, our anxiety, our fear. Only God can do all that. See, we were not meant to be the burden bearer. So many people carry so much stuff. You need to release it to God and let Him restore your soul. Restoration. Restoration. I found something on the internet about the four R's of restoration. I had no idea there was four R's of restoration. You know, there's four R's. Everybody's got all these things, right? All this stuff. I mean, we, we try, to, try to always put out something, something neat or something fancy or something with alliteration or something that's catchy or whatever. But I started looking at this. The four R's of restoration. First is replace. We, we got to start somewhere, right? Amen. We start lost and then we're found. And God replaces our hearts. The hearts of stone with the heart of flesh. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. Ezekiel 36, 26. I'll just pop over there real quick just to, just to share that with you. There's times when we need to be reminded, amen, of what God has done in us. Do you ever need to be reminded of something? Do you ever need to be told again, a repeat, right? How many of you have little children or someone you got to tell something 20 times to? Huh? 
I mean, to where you're like, man, I can't believe I, I told you this. I told you this over and over and over again. Part of the job of the under shepherd or the pastor is to tell you again. You may say, man, your sermons are old, Rick. You say the same stuff every Sunday. Well, praise God, because I'm giving you the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm giving you the words of life. I'm giving you what you need to be, to be overcomers in Christ Jesus. I'm giving you that. It tells us this in verse 26 of chapter 36 of Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you, uh, and give you a heart of flesh. He says this in 27, listen to this now. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. All of a sudden I hear this, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. That reminds me that, that, that I will maketh them to lie down, amen. That, that through his statutes and through the goodness of God and the word of God, he's able to, to move us in a direction. He's able to move us somewhere. Amen. He, he renews us. Hallelujah. He replaces us in our hearts. There's time when we first were unsaved. We were lost. We were dead to sin. And then through Christ, we have been quickened. Through him, we have been brought to life. He took the heart of stone out of us and gave us a heart of flesh. Do any of you remember when you had a heart of stone? Does anybody remember? You remember? I remember when I had a heart of stone. Huh? I know some people say, I don't remember that. I'm not going to admit it. That's all right. The preacher will admit it. I remember when I had a heart of stone. Amen. I remember when people come and ask me for something. You know what I tell them? Go get a job. Huh? And then if they say, well, I'm working a job. And I said, well, well, you need to work it out. You need to get a better job then. You need to do something. Don't come asking me for anything. I'm not going to give you nothing. Everything I've got, I've got by the sweat of my brow. I've worked hard, and that's why I've got what I've got. Anybody? Can I get a witness in the house today about a heart of stone? Amen. Where people come to you and they look at you and they're expecting maybe a handout or a gift or, or at least a kind word or something. And you don't give them nothing. What you do is you step on their neck and you tell them, look, you're like this because this is what you've done. Huh? Heart of stone. My problem now is I have a heart of flesh. Huh? And when people come to me. I'll near about give him the shirt off my back. I mean, look, and then my heart breaks for him. And then I, then I sit and I, I wonder, why are they like that? And then the Lord's like convicting me. Look, Rick, don't worry about why they're like that. Just, just show them the love of Christ and show them, and show them some love. Show them some mercy. Show them some grace. Show them something besides what the world's going to give them. Because the people that have the stony hearts are the worldly people. They don't care about nobody but themselves. And so, so God gives us that, that he renews us, he makes us new, he, he replaces the old heart, and then he renews us through the word. Amen? I mean, I want you to think about this for a second. There's supposed to be a change that takes place in us. There's supposed to be something that happens. I mean, I, I know that, that, that it's not a perfect work. I know that when someone gets saved, that they just don't change overnight. Amen? Do you all remember when you first got saved? Now, some of you already were, were saints even before you were saved somehow. That you never did nothing wrong ever in your whole life. Never said a crossword. Never did anything. Okay, that won't me. It won't me. It won't me. Me. Oh, God took... A heart of stone out of me and he placed a heart of flesh but then the work started then the process of of renewal the process of, of changing who I was because you see what has to happen is that although your heart has been cleansed although your heart your mind your head's got to catch up with where your heart is amen you got you got your head's got to catch up there's a problem your your heart your heart's renewed your heart heart has been replaced with a with a good heart a heart of flesh but your mind has got to catch up with your heart your 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 mind has got to catch up with your position in Christ you're 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 sitting somewhere hallelujah but you ain't worked it out yet right you you're, you you got to get get there you got to allow your mind to be renewed now here's the thing it tells us in in Romans chapter 12 verse 2 and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm here to tell you that I started thinking about conformed to the world. 
conformed to the world. Don't be conformed to the world. Well, what's that mean? What's that mean? Don't be conformed to the world. What's it mean? Don't do like the world does. And yet, the latest and greatest in megachurches is even more worldly than what the world can be. I mean, I see stuff on TikTok like everybody else and Facebook and different things. I probably shouldn't say stuff like this, but I'm going to say it. The church is very worldly in the United States. Too worldly. Too much of the world, dragging too much of the world in. And I was watching one of the mega churches, and they had a really catchy title that Sunday. So, man, this is something I might want to check out. It was called the Super Bowl of Preaching. I said, man, this sounds good, though. Super Bowl of Preaching? Brother Preston, me and you, and we can get some up here. We can have the Super Bowl of Preaching, right? You give him a word, I'll give him a word. We may even let Brother Joey up there, let him have a word or two. In. Maybe just a word or two now. I'm not saying we give him a much. But we let Joey get in there. Amen. And there might be some, we let Sister Sister Wendy, you get you a word in there. Hallelujah. Amen. And we get we got the Super Bowl of Preaching. Woo! And I'm thinking, man, that would be like one Holy Ghost filled, absolutely exciting thing. And then I clicked to the video. Ooh. And I didn't know what it was for sure. It was actually a church service. And and it looked like your basic rock and roll show. Don't be conformed to the world, right? But we, we want to make sure we get... See, here's the problem in the church, okay? We're so worried about lost people that we're willing to get our people lost to get people in. Did you hear what I'm saying? That we're so worried about the unsaved out there that we're willing to lose our very flock over the garbage in the world. Now I'm here to tell you that I'm going to be seeker friendly in the sense you want to know about Jesus. I will tell you, but I'm not going to lose and endanger my flock and bring that garbage into my church. It ain't happening. We ain't going there. We ain't going to do that. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, we can't be just like the world. You don't use the same bait that the world used to get people in the church. You know how you get people in the church? Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tell them, look, I'm here to tell you that you might be lost, that you might be addicted, that you might be lost in sin, that all these things might be happening. But can I tell you there is one named Jesus who can speak to your condition? I don't care how far gone, how far lost you are, that there's one named Jesus Christ that if you'll cry out to him, oh, hallelujah, he'll give you the Holy Spirit and he'll give you the ability to walk yourself right on out of what you're in. Hallelujah. That's that's what I'm talking about. So the Super Bowl of preaching. So they do a coin toss. Right? I'm like, what's this all about? And they, they flip a coin. And the senior pastor, which I had to do some research, but the senior pastor, he calls tails. He says, because I'm going to kick your tail. Which he tells the other pastor, right? And they said, you want to receive or do you want to kick? Oh, this is getting interesting. Okay. All right. What's going to happen next? And so what they do is they got a little referee out there. And he takes a Bible. And he, he puts it on the stage and holds it like a football. Okay. And then the, then the other pastor, one of the other pastors, the lady pastor, comes up and kicks the Bible out into the crowd. Exactly. Now, I'm not allowed to talk about other churches or other ministries and all this stuff. And people say, well, there's people getting saved here. Well, they may very, very, oh, by the grace of God, somebody's getting saved in that place, okay? I'm just saying. If, the, if any kind of word at all is being preached in there, the word of God is so powerful that even in a reprobate church, people are going to get saved. I'm here to tell you, we ain't going to be kicking no Bibles around here. We're not doing that. But that's how far the world, and this place is not like a little church. This is like 30,000 people in a 10 different locations and all this stuff. That's church now, y'all. 
the Lord spoke to me and said, Rick, what you need to do in your church is you need to preach the Word of God. That you need to preach it to them. And if you preach the same thing over and over again, if all you preach is John 3.16, if all you preach is the, is the Lord's Prayer, if all you preach is the 23rd Psalm, if all you preach is the goodness of God, then that's good enough. Amen. Don't try to entertain the people with all this mess. Give them the Word of God and allow God Almighty to change them. And that, that's, where, that's where we've got to be. We've got to understand that God is sovereign. God is mighty. God is powerful. But we've got to renew our minds. They've got to be transformed. Four hours of restoration, I'll jump through this. Replace, renew, revive through the resurrection of Jesus. We're given new, eternal, everlasting life, y'all. I'm here to tell I want you to think about that for a second. Do you like eternal life? Amen. Everlasting life. Do you like the fact that you're never going to die? Hallelujah. Oh, you'll die physically, but you're not going to die spiritually. Praise God. The last breath here, the first breath, you'll be in the presence of God. Hallelujah. We're looking for that kind of promise. Replace, renew, revive, and return to God through the saving work of Jesus on the cross. We are reunited with God. Can I tell you, without Christ, we are at enmity with God. We are, we are at war with God without Jesus. And we, we've got to understand that there's so many folks that think, well, I'm not really that bad of a person. Well, I'm here to tell you that if you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then your heart is desperately wicked. And who can know it? And all those things. And we've got to allow Jesus, hallelujah, His imputed righteousness to be the thing that we're aiming for. All right. Back to 23rd Psalm. Verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Can I tell you something about God? That no matter where you find yourself, He is there with you. Do you understand that? Do you understand that if you're a blood-bought believer... Amen. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives in you. Then no matter where you are or what you're doing, He is there every step of the way. He is there no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter what is going on in your life. And there's a lot of times that we see circumstances and situations where we're like, God can't be here. I'm telling you, He is there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. No matter what I'm up against, no matter what's put out in front of me, no matter what is going on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk because I know that God is with me. He's not left me. He's not forsaken me. So many times we look at our situation and we think, where's God? What's happened? God has abandoned me. God has left me. He's not left you. He's not gone anywhere. He is there. Even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God lives in us. Is that exciting? Is that exciting to anybody in the house today? That the Holy Spirit of God is living in you. Amen. Is that exciting to anybody? That you have someone there to lead you, guide you, direct you. Through, the, through this life, through the difficulties of this life. He's there. And then verse 5 goes even better. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. I want you to think about that for a second. God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God prepares a table. Amen. Have you ever been a guest at someone's house? Huh? You ever been a guest at someone's house? Amen. Most of the times when you go to be a guest at someone's house, you don't have to bring the food. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God will prepare the meal for you. God will prepare the table before you. No matter, even in the presence of your enemies, even in the midst of all those things, God is there in the midst of that. He is there. He's walking with us even in the midst of things where it appears that we are in the presence of our enemies. God is not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. He's going to keep on delivering. He's going to keep on uh, uh, 
blessing us through the midst of that. And I'm here to tell you that, that that's a blessing to know that God prepares a table for me, even in the presence of my enemies, that he anoints my head with oil. And not only that, but that my cup runs over. Y'all, the goodness of God is so good. Oh my goodness, the goodness of God is so good. God just doesn't fill your cup. Your cup runs over in the goodness of God. Now see, we've got to get this in our minds. We've got to get this in our heart. When we start reading this thing, we need to understand what God has really done for us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, although I look at my circumstances and I think that, that something's going on. I'm here to tell you that no matter what your circumstances are, walk by faith and not by sight. Know who your shepherd is. Know that God is there with you. Know that he's going to lead you in the green pasture. He's going to restore you. He's going to put you beside the still waters. He's going to absolutely lead us in paths of righteousness. And even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to be afraid. That's a scary place to be. And yet God says, I'll be with you. I'll not leave you. I'll not forsake you. I'll be with you in the midst of all of this. That even in the midst of that, God will minister to you. And your cup will run over. Paul said in Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Jesus, God will supply all your needs, all your needs, according to his riches. What do you think about it? Do you believe that today? Do you believe that today? Do you believe that God is with you? Do you believe that no matter what you face, God is there? Do you believe that God's spirit inhabits you? Do you believe that he's here with us? Because we've chosen him as our shepherd, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Would you all stand with me as we close today? I ask you, who's your shepherd today? Amen. Who's your shepherd today? Who's your shepherd? Who's walking with you through the storms of life? Who's your shepherd today? Amen. Amen. Who's your shepherd? Who do you put your faith in, your trust in? Yourself or God? Where, where is your, your trust and your faith today? Is it in yourself or is it in God? Have you chosen the Lord God Almighty to be your shepherd today? If you have, can I tell you, that that's a glorious place to be. If you've been, if you've trusted Him, can I tell you that you don't have to worry because God will be there even in the midst of the trial, the tribulation, the situation that you're in, that God is there, that no matter what the diagnosis, no matter what somebody's spoken over you, that God is in the midst, no matter what you might face, no matter what you're up against, that God is there. And I encourage you today, I encourage you today to realize the benefits of Christ, the benefits of being a believer, that we don't have to worry about these things anymore because God has us in the midst of all of it. God is there. So I encourage you today. I encourage you. Amen. I encourage you. Renee.